William Hopley, your favorite videographer from Two Hats Publishing. I welcome you to another Two Hats special of community events. Let's look in and see what's really happening. Good afternoon and welcome to Lambda Weekly. I'm Dave Taffet here in the studio with Ron Landis, the late Patty Fink, just pulled into our parking lot. She <laughs> did. She'll be in in just a minute. First time she's done that since she's married. She's always <laughs> been here yep. on the in the nick of time, just as the theme song is ending. She screeches into the parking lot, comes racing into the studio, but she'll be in in a minute. Our guest today, uh, work with the ACA, I guess. Um, uh, March Petty is uh, an, an appointed official with the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, and our other guest is Daniel Bhutan, who's with the Community Council of Greater Dallas. And he works with a team of navigators, and he'll tell us what he does. Um, first of all, let's just start with you hear the ACA, and the initial thing that people think is, oh, well, that's gone. It's not. Right? Right. Okay, right. so people, there, there is a deadline this week to sign up for insurance. It's December 15th. Right. And people should worry about it or not? Uh, no, you should not worry about it. This is, uh, um, and David, thank you so much for the privilege of being with you all today. I'm thrilled to be here. Yeah, very few people call this a privilege. <laughs> oh, I do. Are you kidding? I'm thrilled to be here. We're, we're thrilled to have yeah. We're delighted to have no, you. No, thank you. Well, you know, you all know, I'm sure, that the Obama administration has believed and been really committed to the health and wellness of all Americans, which means to the level of equality. And so we've been very proud to do our part to protect the rights of the LGBT community. And um, so... I'm here and pleased to represent the administration in that regard. Your question specifically in terms of whether uh, the consumer should worry about signing up, the answer is no. The reality is that the um, deadline for them to begin with their health insurance in January 1 is December 15th. Though there is the opportunity to enroll through January 31st, we don't wait. You know, you can be covered in January if you meet that Thursday, December 15th deadline. And the reality of it is insurance companies are signing a contract with the consumer to offer them insurance and assure that they get that. So For the year. For the year. So, that so one thing that I can, that, and I've actually heard a couple of people say this, why should I sign up for insurance for January and then it's gone in February? That's not what you're signing up for. You're signing up for insurance for the year. That's correct. Yep. And you're actually in signing up for insurance in the private market with private insurance companies. The federal piece of it is it's a portal that you go through to shop, to see what you can compare the plans, see what's available. The doctors that are on your um, consumer list, the prescriptions that you need, you can determine that ahead of time um, with help from people like Daniel here in the Dallas DFW community and the surrounding community all the way down to Waco. Well, let's just go uh, right to Daniel. Daniel, tell us what it is that you do and how you can help people and how to get in touch with you. Perfect. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me. And just like Marjorie was saying, um, I lead a group of certified navigators through the federal government um, to access uh, health care and affordable health care and quality health care uh, for the for the community. Um, what we do, it, we, we take care of 56 counties and um, 
Again, uh, the community council uh, helps the community address the needs that they have, and one of those needs is health care. Mm-hmm. So uh, we sit with consumers. We, we help them uh, look at their options, and just like Marjorie was saying, we help them access uh, um, different options through the marketplace. Again, uh, the marketplace is just, a play, is, is just the, 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 the point where we are going to look at all the different options different insurance companies um, and the navigators are going to help the community look at those plans, making sure that they are selecting the plan that fits their needs uh, when it comes to providers, when it comes to medications. I do want to mention that the marketplace, it's it's new and improved and, and it's amazing the tools that we can find, uh, uh, healthcare.gov that um, help the community find medications, making sure that we're looking at, at the providers that, that the, the, the consumer is needing and before they enroll, making sure that, that they enroll in the plan that they're going to need. So uh, basically that's that's what we, we do right now. Do you all go out to the community and, you know, to try and, and get consumers or educate them or do you let them come to you? Absolutely. So, so a little bit of both. Um, we are um, out in the field helping consumers. Um, the best way to to uh, get a hold of us is through our, our direct 800 number. And if you don't mind, David, let me share sure. that. 844-831-9600. And that is our 800 number that goes directly to our office. Again, we, c- we take care of 19 counties um, that community council uh, um, um, is in charge of, but like Marjorie was saying, we go down to Waco. We have 56 different counties that that we are serving, and uh, we take care of the consumer directly in our office here in Dallas, Mm -hmm. or we have navigators, again, in 56 different counties that meet consumers out in the field, um, and again, that's the the navigator uh, for the the community community. to help, you know, help the community access uh, uh, health care. What are some of the things that specifically the LGBT community might be looking for? It might be slightly different than the community in general. Slightly different, but I think, you know, for the LGBT community, I want to make sure that that uh, we, we are uh, completely trained and, and, and friendly to access the needs. But, you know, um, for the past two, three years, we've been helping the, the LGBT community um, HIV positive. Um, I want to say that it's a very detailed process uh, to make sure that we help the consumer access uh, the, the, the doctors that they're, they're helping and access medications. And again, with these new tools through healthcare.gov that help us, and it's very, very easy uh, but help us find um, uh, the plans that covers those medications and covers treatments and covers uh, uh, the doctors that they're helping with those treatments. So um, that's what we're doing in the community council and the navigators helping helping uh, uh, consumers um, HIV positive to, to access the right plans, the right medications, and the right providers. David, I might mention that the administration just recently put out an annual HHS LGBT report, and one of the things, the three things that they cited, one is that there's a permanent LGBT health advisor to the secretary in D.C. that is career. It's not a political person that's going to come and go, but that's a career person that is in place at infinitum. Uh, the second thing is an enhanced LGBT health data collection and research opportunity so that, for example, we've added questions about sexual orientation to the National Health Interview Survey, which helps collect information so that we can better serve that community. And then the third thing is the Affordable Care Act. Well, how has that affected the LGB community in particular? Beyond extending coverage to about 20 million Americans currently that are insured through the Affordable Care Act, it ensures that the LGBT Americans can't be charged higher premiums because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. And earlier this year, we did finalize a provision in the law, 1557, for you, those of you that like to get into the weeds. Uh, that, which, that would be Patty. Who would, okay. That was going to be my question. Let's okay. talk about 1557. Okay, great. That's exactly where I was going, the 1557, which requires, basically, uh, makes it clear that people cannot be denied health care or coverage 
coverage based on their sex, including gender identity or sex stereotyping. And among other things, this means that transgender people can no longer be denied health coverage just for being who they are. That's wonderful. So that is in place that as of July. So all providers... Uh, and, and some of this is an education process, okay? I'm going to assume the best that it's an opportunity to educate and educate providers about the rights um, that the LGBT community has and, um, you know, so that we're partners in the community in providing that health care. And you might not even know this yet, but one of the problems transgender people have had in having their health covered is that there are certain sex-specific um things th- that a doctor tests for uh so if somebody is um male is female to male and gets uterine cancer well it's not covered you're a man are they now mandated to just treat the person that if you happen to have a uterus and you have uterine cancer it'll be covered that's correct or you know a s- similar example would be uh breast cancer mm-hmm. exams you know, that's not just for women. No, men get it you also. Know, men have breast cancer as well. So it's important that um, for the LGBT community, I think, to know our partners in that community, to know, in fact, that their voices have been heard and all these kinds of points that have been made by that community has made has really brought us to the point where we can be more responsive um, and there's the opportunity for that education to occur. And 1557 actually applies for policies that begin January 1st. So if people were to enroll, Section 1557 would apply to them. That's correct. So that's a big thing to consider out there, everybody. You know, it's that's a non-discrimination statement. That's correct. That's very and strong for us. And um, we need to take advantage of that and, and get, the, the, get health, the care we need, you know. Exactly, Pat. And, you know, the health de- delivery partners also um, have been furnished and are being furnished regularly um, the ten things with which they have to inc- comply, which includes notice to the LGBTQ uh, Q community as they come into a facility that, in fact, they have rights to be treated mm-hmm. um, without discrimination mm-hmm. excellent um excellent. one of the things that um and this is where I, okay i won't mention my company my insurance company um <laughs> where they drive me nuts daniel one of the things you do is you help people uh go on healthcare.gov figure out okay this policy your doctor is on that policy these drugs are covered by this policy and we have had cases over the last few years where okay, we're no longer covering this drug. And if you're on an HIV med that's been keeping you alive, you don't want to go to that other drug and see if it will work too. Um, The other thing that this company, whose headquarters are right up the street here, um, has done is um, Texas Health Resource is no longer covered on the policy, and that's in the middle of the year. Well, that's not just one little doctor's office, that's Presbyterian Hospital, Harris Methodist Hospitals, hospitals all over that all of a sudden you can't go to, and it's in the middle of the year. What what do you do about that? Because you can't go back to healthcare.gov during the year and say, well, my doctor is at this hospital, and I want to continue using the services that I contracted for at the beginning of the year. But you cannot go back and, and change your plan, can you? Or can you? Well, you can if you qualify for a special enrollment period. So, um, sadly, uh, you know, your provider um, um, pulling out of, 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 of that of one bracket, particular of coverage, hospital particular program. hospital, or, um, it's not something that we, we can control. Um, and, and, but you can't change in the middle of the year. You, you can, you, you, you can or, change. You can change plans, and and, um, and you could access plans if you qualify for a special enrollment period. Um, which are, what are some things? Which, a special enrollment period, example, you know, marriage, uh, change of income. Mm-hmm. Um, if you change a job. Change a job. All, all you those lost things. coverage. Right. Or have a child. 
have a child. So all of those qualify you for a special enrollment right. period. You could access any time. And, of the and that's year. not this. This is, you know, we're with one company. We're with them for the year and can't change that. What you're, what you're talking about is the adequacy of network. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It, is there a reason that I can't change my provider, but my provider can change who can provide that service to me in the middle of a contract when we signed a contract with them at the beginning of the year? Well, you know, the, um, the consumer also always has the right to appeal some of those changes to the insurance company, and there's a procedure. Oftentimes, no. there's there's several steps that you can go through um, to have those appeals. Um, you may note that some of the insurance companies have gone to an MCO so that there are uh, multiple providers with a, a particular group um, as opposed to the PPO where you could go mm -hmm. directly to an individual provider. And that's another example of some of the adjustments that are occurring in the market over time as the insurance companies better understand the needs of the consumers that they're serving. So, um, unfortunately, there are challenges with certain populations, and I think it's an important issue for the LGBT community particularly to be very vocal about. Mm -hmm. So that there, I think that what you will find even going forward and certainly looking past that there has been a continual attempt to have as few disruptions as possible in the economics as well as in the health delivery system. Mm -hmm. Though a big emphasis on the ACA has been refining the delivery system and putting the people first, what are those um, groups that provide services that are the best informed about a specific population. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of adjustments that will continue, I think, um, to occur mm -hmm. in the in the plans. Uh, one adjustment we we could make in Texas is that our governor and our legislature could, you know, have a state exchange and expand Medicaid in our state. But we're one of those states that doesn't. Um, well, it's good for you to mention that because actually there are 31 states across the country. I think the larger question is, and I hear people in the communities all the time, and Daniel is with one of the groups within a coalition in the DFW area, which includes numerous, numerous not-for-profits and for-profit entities as well as insurance agents that really are partners in providing these services. But what you'll find is the question that's raised about all vulnerable populations, not just the Medicaid, but, you know, the elderly. Mm -hmm. and exactly. We need to take a break, and we're going to be talking a little bit more about this uh, after the break. Our guests are Marge Petty. She's from the Department of Health and Human Services, and Daniel Bouton. He's from Community Council of Greater Dallas. Um, it's the second annual Canawin Toy Drive coming up on Saturday, December 17th. That's next Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Canawin is collecting toys for Children's Medical Center. Toys can be dropped at the Canawin Studios. I should say the beautiful Canawin Studios at 11311 North Central Expressway at Top Ten Records at 338 West Jefferson Boulevard in Oak Cliff or Sons of Herman Hall, uh, 3414 Elm Street in Deep Ellum. Uh, free tacos will be served from Taco Deli, free barbecue, live music from Ernie Johnson, Pat, Joe Pat Hannon, uh, Hugo King, Greg A. Smith, and JMAC, Intensify Sunlight Choir, uh, Twang liner. Can you tell I did not read this ahead of time? Uh, K.M. Williams, Lazith, uh, Hartley Bristol, Pastor Bernie de T. Scott, uh, Renee Maldonado, and the Dallas exclusive uh, Boys Cadets. Last year it was on Sunday, and it was during our show. It was a lot of fun. Stop by because uh, it, it really is a lot of fun. Just bring a toy. Bring it unwrapped. Uh, they, I know they distribute them throughout the hospital. Um, just last week, we were over at Children's Hospital. We were delivering uh, toys uh, or teddy, teddy bears. bears from the teddy bear party. Uh, they were our guests a couple of weeks ago. That was a lot of fun. And kids were already, as we were delivering, coming up to us and saying, can we have a teddy bear? These toys make a difference in those kids' lives. So the event is free. 
Bring an unwrapped toy next Sunday, 10 to 4 p.m., and we'll be back with more Lambda Weekly right after this. Hi, this is Patty Fink, and you're listening to Lambda Weekly on 89.3 KNON-FM. And welcome back to uh, Lambda Weekly uh, on KNON FM in Dallas. We're talking to Marge Petty from the Department of Health and Human Services and Daniel Bouton, who's from the Community Council of Greater Dallas. We're talking about the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, uh, or more commonly known as Obamacare. Obamacare. Uh, we like the Affordable Care Act. We hate Obamacare, and it's going to be repealed. But the ACA, we really like. And we Isn't like that it. bizarre? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they've, they've done, like, polling and pe- found people. There are people in this country who believe that there are two different things. <laughs> <laughs> they like one and hate the other. It's really bizarre. Yeah, but, but they're th- the same thing. Funny. Obamacare is the Affordable Care Act. It is. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions out there about what the ACA is, what it isn't, uh, what it is doing, what it's not doing. Um, but this is for either of you. Um, you know, you're, you guys are in there talking to the people who've got actually got it. What is, what is the feedback from them? What are they saying? Are, you know, are they liking it? Like pr- prior to them not having insurance. Well, I think one of the one of the key things is there are certainly elements that would affect a lot of individuals and families if, in fact, it were repealed. You know, the repeal and replace is a political slogan, actually, and um, it's really important for people, I think, to separate that rhetoric from the reality. Right now, we've got 20 million people now that have health insurance who didn't have it before. Um, No one actually can be discriminated against based on pre-existing conditions or you know, at one point, they might even consider that being a female was a pre-existing condition because we had to pay more money uh, for our premiums just because we were females. So uh, we're talking about 129 million people that would be affected uh, and impacted by the pre-existing condition change that might be made. Do you, and- do you know one thing that was considered a pre-existing condition for a while was being gay? Um I remember there was a time during the late 80s or early 90s where the insurance where our company was in the 75219 zip code, which is Oak Lawn, was going to be four times as high as if we listed our company address four blocks away where we had our company office our main company office as opposed to a store that we had right on Cedar Springs. It was going to be about four times as much because it was a different zip code. So That's a no-no now. The, yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah, n- now rates are uh, determined by the city, aren't they? Or area or even county. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Way. So you can't just discriminate, oh, the gay people live in that neighborhood. And, and literally it was going to be four times as high. Wow. For us, and, you because know, some, of who we were. Some of the key elements that are part of the ACA include um, the donut hole. I mean, if it were repealed, it would reopen the donut hole. There are 11 million Medicare prescription drug beneficiaries that would save currently an average of about 2,000 per beneficiary, and that's compared to now. Um, it would kick young adults under age 26 off their parents' plans. Very popular measure. Anybody yes. that's got kids under, <laughs> under 27. Anyone who's under 26. That. Exactly. Mm-hmm. exactly. Um, it e- except could, the way millennials are right now. I guess I shouldn't say this. They'd want to say on their parents' policies beyond that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Go to 35, 40. Still on my parents' policy. You know, the, an additional I- impact could be that Ten million Americans now receive tax credits for the purchase of their premiums, um, up to almost three thousand a year uh, for some individuals, and it could also raise the cost of one hundred and fifty million people with employer coverage who could again face annual or lifetime limits. And currently, um, those are unlimited. And, so, and when you're talking about lifetime limits, some of the things you're talking about is like for HIV care. Uh, the drugs exactly. can cost. Truvada is one of the main drugs. It's a thousand dollars a month, so that's twelve thousand dollars. It adds up quickly. Exactly. Um, an emergency room visit, if you have something wrong, forty thousand dollars. Well, if you have a few of those, you're getting you're going to bump up towards your million dollar limit pretty quickly. Right. You know, if you look at the numbers of uh, the percentage of people that have a pre-existing condition, um, it's about it's a about 50% of 
40 to 50 percent. Um, so those folks really were squeezed out of the market previously. Um, one of the things that's been talked about in a, a, a new idea uh, to be proposed would be similar to go back to the high-risk pools that have existed under every state, but the pr- n- not only the premiums, it was really a catastrophic um, care, basically, maybe a $10,000 deductible, so that it really squeezed people out of the market in terms of affordability. So I think one of the things people need to keep in mind as there is a discussion about new ideas or a repeal, even though they're for about six years they've talked about this and nothing has occurred, is to look at the three issues. Is it accessible? You know, how available is it at an uninsu- at a low cost rate with a subsidy? Um, does the quality exist? Is there financial security and the protections that occur now? And is it again a- affordable? Uh, does it increase costs for people who are on Medicaid or Medicare? And is it fiscally responsible? Does it increase? ultimately the budget deficit and um, we've got a lot of reports from the Congressional Business Office how those kinds of things would be impacted. I think a lot of people don't realize that let's say it's pre-ACA and steadily premiums are climbing, 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 the cost of health care, more deductibles, I mean it's just higher and higher and then the Affordable Care Act came along and while premiums may still climb, they're not climbing at the rate They were. And so when people complain that their premium may be higher this year than, say, it was last year, um, it doesn't mean the ACA was going to level and zero out any kind of um, increases. But, boy, has it stemmed the... Stem the market because we had a stupid system before. Right. <laughs> we had a really stupid and it system. varied according to state. I mean, mm-hmm. but the average was about a twelve percent increase. And even with some of the discussions that have occurred about premium increases now, it's still remarkably lo- lower. And you that. know, you hear these people say, "Well, my my insurance went up." Well, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's probably going to go up. It's the ACA wasn't promising to, you know, to to not. Um, you yeah, address that, but it takes time. The whole plan is to span like 10 years. Right. To and that's really change those, the fundamental infrastructure of the system. And that was one of those misconceptions I was talking about. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think it's important to, you know, to share some of that um, uh, CMS uh, data that says that 73% of Texans um, can find plans less than $75 a month for their premium. Um, what what is the quality know? of those plans? What are people getting as opposed to on the marketplaces paying a little bit more and getting getting more? Uh, do you see what I'm saying? Um, how, how good are those plans that people are getting for $75? If they pay a little bit more, how much more are they actually getting on average? Because you're talking about a bunch of different plans there. Right. And uh, when I talk about, um, you know, the, the 70, 73% that could access those plans for less than $75, there's many different factors. I think the quality of the plan is the same as... Somebody like me that I'm getting a plan through my employer, somebody that goes through the marketplace that could access that same plan, the quality of the plan is the same. It's just it's just the different factors that, that people that go through the marketplace could apply for a, fa- uh, a, a premium tax credit to lower that premium. Somebody that doesn't have, you know, the, the blessing, somebody like me or, or you that have access to health care through their employer, mm-hmm. but access to health care through the marketplace. Um, so, so they are the same plans, basically, right? Correct. Just, you know, to circle back to what Marjorie was saying earlier, the marketplace is just the, the, the meeting point where you're going to look at many different options and many different private market companies. So, so you, and again, I don't want to say a, a, a insurance company because I don't want to forget one of them, but you could access and, and see all the different options. Again, the plans, uh, uh, and, you know, just to go back to what Patty was saying and to circle back to that, um, that's something very important to remember. People are not enrolling into Obamacare. That that really doesn't exist. Um, it's just it, a nickname. It's, it's a, a nickname. nickname, absolutely. So it's the Affordable Care Act, and 
In the Affordable Care Act, we have the marketplace, and the marketplace is a meeting point where we are going to look at many different options. Right, in you're the not private market. In yeah, the you're private. not uh, you're not enrolling in Obamacare. You're Absolutely. enrolling in Blue Cross or United Healthcare or whatever. At no correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's correct. You know, one of the other things that might be of interest to your listeners is that. Um, Research is showing right now that about half of the remaining uninsured do not know that there are premium tax credits that are available to keep their coverage affordable. So say somebody has their own private business, and so they have to be self-insured. They don't belong to a large group of insured that can help balance risk of who's healthy and who's not. So they're out there by themselves, and they may go directly to an insurance plan and sign up for insurance, where if they'd gone to the marketplace, they could get a subsidy to be insured by perhaps the same insurance company. So um, interestingly enough, I've got data just on Texas. There, Right now we know that the number of consumers potentially who are eligible for a premium tax credit for this coming year, 38,600 people who would be eligible but may have already enrolled in an insurance plan where they're not getting any subsidy at all. Wow. Uh, we, we've, we've talked about or mentioned the possibility of, of the Affordable Care Act being repealed. If that were to happen, we're, how many uh, uh, people are we looking at that could potentially lose um, health insurance? Well, I think it's conceivable that about, uh, I mentioned earlier, the impact could be uh, on as many as 129 million people. And it depends on what the content of that repeal would look like. If, in fact, uh, it did not include pre-existing conditions, we're talking about 129 million people nationally that might be squeezed out of the market in terms of affordability. Um, so it just depends on what the details of that would look like. Sure. But I do have to say that um, really the ACA opponents have promised that replacement, you know, they've talked about replacement now for about six years, but there is Not much. Some, yeah, <laughs> they don't know. Well, they haven't seen anything. <laughs> right. In terms of the detail. Right. You're exactly right, Pat. But what I think um, is important to remember is that there's been a lot of concern about the disruption and, um, you know, some language saying, you know, we don't want there to be disruption in the market. Well, if you look even in the paper today, Dallas Morning News talked about hospitals and insurance companies saying they're concerned about the stability if, in fact, there were changes made and what that, um, what that would look like. So we're talking about all of us being affected in some way, either whether or not we can get insurance or not, or the rest of us in terms of economically, how that might impact the entire market. You know, part of the challenge with the ACA is that the pieces of this were put together very carefully. So you've got the entire look, which include people with pre-existing conditions, but also the mandate that everybody participates. So you've got younger, healthier people, perhaps, that help balance out the costs. And so that's an important piece economically. Mm -hmm. Certainly for an insurance company looking to um, open, to offer something in the marketplace. And to price it. Right. They need those those younger folks to participate. And and going back to what you brought up earlier, Patty, um, about health premiums going up every year and now pre ACA they was going up like rapidly but now they're still going up but not at the same rate. If the repeal were if, if the ACA was totally gutted, let's so just they got rid of it all and started all over, wouldn't that make that would go um, take our premiums going right back up even higher at a, at a higher rate? Well, again, you know, it's difficult to talk about hypotheticals because we don't know what the details of that would look like. And, you know, there were hours spent on the comprehensiveness of the ACA as it stands right now, which also includes delivery service reform, the focus on uh, a family health home that people would go to that would know that they could go to for preventive peace. So. This was not just a short-term view. It was a long-term view that included how do people participate in their own health, 
the prevention piece, which you had mentioned earlier, raising questions about some of the immunizations and the preventive health exams that are available without cost when you are part of the ACA, so that you can have that continuum of uh, everybody contributing to their own health as it improves the health of the community itself. And I think one of the important things that we need to remember about the ACA and the whole idea of it um, and the kind of cradle-to-grave approach of of comprehensiveness and and trying to control costs and such um, is that... um, (laughs) I've lost my thought now. Because I'm, <laughs> I'm squeaking the microphone yeah, down. Might be a, down yeah, yeah, oh, three no, no, no. Your level. Um, but the whole idea of it was we've gone, we've been living as a sick community. That's, and we we think of the world in terms of illness and sickness. Um, and the ACA is, is it, through lots of different factors and, and, and pressures and um, programs. Um, over time is wants to move us from an idea of sickness to an idea of wellness. And so, I mean, how many times have before have we gone for a, a preventive care and not had to pay anything? Right. I mean, that that's part of the design is to get people to think about prevention because it's, for one, it's so much cheaper to pay for prevention than to wait till somebody gets so incredibly sick and maybe they're uninsured and they show up at an ER and that's their health care. And that comes back on all of us. Mm-hmm. If they go to Parkland, that's, a, that's that's on all of us. That's on all of us. Mm-hmm. And so that that prevention thing and that wellness focus and the turning of it, I think that is already entrenched now in the marketplace of of providers and I carriers. Think you're right, Pat. And I don't think there's any turning back. And when I look at like the company I work for in health IT, um, that's an assumption. We move on. We are. I mean. In, in our industry, that's we're going to wellness. <laughs> you know, and you know to underscore what you're saying. You know, I think many of the healthcare providers, I'm thinking hospitals in particular, um, were on this course already. And what occurred when the ACA was passed is that it accelerated the look they were taking of the rate of infections that people get when right. they get into the hospital, and how they've turned that back around or the reduction in the cost savings that have occurred in the U.S. with there's a 30-day rule if people are in the hospital and they return after 30 days it's a ding on the hospital so it's encouraged hospitals to do more of a of a wraparound look mm-hmm. how to prevent that re um, entry into the hospitals it has saved two billions of dollars mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's cheaper to keep the patient in the hospital one more day and make sure they're well than have them come back sicker than they were before and stay for a week. Right, or a, to build community services around those folks to make certain that they're taking their medications or that they're doing their follow-up hospital visits and look at some of the social determinants that are mm-hmm. part of that. And just the fact that people are well. <laughs> well, you know, I was just going to say, this week I went for my annual exam and I got two vaccines. One of them was Prevnar. Well, isn't it cheaper to give me a Prevnar vaccine? I don't know how much it is even, but if it's $100 or $200, because some of those vaccines are that expensive. So $200 or treat me for pneumonia. Right. You know, which one's cheaper? Right? Exactly. You're listening to Lambda Weekly on 89.3 KNON FM. I'm Dave Taffet here in the studio with the late Patty Fink and Laurent Landis. And our guests are Marge Petty and Daniel Bouton. And we'll have more with them. We're talking about the Affordable Care Act and uh, more with them in just a moment. And we're talking about the Affordable Care Act. And um, if you didn't hear the beginning of the show, there's a deadline to get insurance and be insured by January 1st. The deadline is December 15th. If you miss that deadline, you have another deadline the end of January to get covered uh, by February for the rest of the year. One of my questions is, if you're not covered for quite the whole year, like you miss this deadline and you, you don't sign up till next Monday and that delays it till February, there's a penalty to pay if you don't have insurance. Is there a penalty to pay for a partial year of not being insured, like not being insured in February in January? Yeah, there's there's a, a percentage. Um, the, the important thing to remember is that there's a three month consecutive uh, um, time grace time that that the federal government and the IRS gives you for not having insurance. So that's why it's it's all planned. The last day is January 31st, um, which makes your insurance effective. Um, 
March 1st. So that's your January, February months that, that you don't have insurance. But um, Right, and, that, and I said the end of January gets you in mm-hmm. February. End of January gets you in March. Correct, okay. correct. But there is a waiver as long as you're insured by the end of that first quarter. Absolutely. Okay. There's, there okay. is a waiver. Now, it's important to remember if you lose coverage in the middle of the year, um, you lose your, your coverage through your employer, there's a 60-day uh, uh, period that you you have to access other options. Oh, um, that's good to know. Yeah, that's that's either COBRA or through the marketplace. Cause, uh, now, COBRA generally is very expensive. That is correct. Um, so the marketplace is open not for people in general, but for somebody who's had a change of um, a life event change. change. A life event change. Correct. The marketplace is open, and you can go to healthcare.gov in that case. Absolutely. So, so Cobra is not your only option. You could access a marketplace and find a plan that it's going to be affordable to mm-hmm. to you, especially if you just you know, lost your job. Um, you know, and we keep saying affordable, and we were talking about this a little bit before the show. Everybody's heard all these plans have gone way up in price, but how does it actually affect most consumers in the marketplace using healthcare.gov? Does it about four dollars? Um, I can't pay that. <laughs> <laughs> the difference would be four dollars, yeah, yeah. and you know, you were mentioned earlier the premium increases. I mean, you know, we've heard that it's five point eight percent premium increase. Well, the average over time has been eight percent or more. So even though there is an increase, it's much less. And mm-hmm. the same is true with employers as well. It's approximately the same. We've seen a three point four percent increase compared to an eight percent average growth over time. So. Um, but I think Daniel's point is really crucial. What happens is the subsidy also increases. So the average of the increase that people are having to pay per month is maybe a $4 increase. And I think that's really important because there is this sort of perception that somehow the Affordable Care Act is driving prices up. But no, they were going up any already, and they were going up a lot higher every year over year. And quicker. Um, right. And the Affordable Care Act, let's just imagine for a moment that all 50 states participated in the state um, marketplace exchanges and, and expanded Medicaid. And uh, young people um, signed up for health insurance, even though they're low risk, very low risk, but they have it in case that, you know, they... They, they mess up their knee and sp- playing soccer or whatever it might be. I mean, it happens. Um, and everybody participated. Costs would come down. Costs would dramatically come down over time. And Kaiser Foundation has all the research that exactly supports what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. But what do we have? We have some uh, GOP governors in states who say, no way. In fact, I'm going to sue the president. Um, and we have lots of folks who are saying, well, I don't need insurance. You know, and this, but they're when they do get sick, it's going to cost all of us. When they when they wait until it's oh gosh, now I've got to really go to the doctor or the ER, that's going to cost all of us. Mm-hmm. And if they had participated from the beginning, they would have had that coverage. Mm-hmm. One of the things that keeps healthcare costs high is are, are those people who go directly to the emergency room. And um, now, even with the Affordable Care Act and more people having insurance. Uh, one of the surprises was more people are going to the emergency room instead of seeking out a private doctor or going to um, an emergency care uh, clinic, you know, the, the doc in the boxes that are uh, out there. Um, but they are still going to the emergency room. It, it seems to me, and, and um, uh, you had said, March, that uh, – they're moving toward this. Seems to me that emergency rooms. I'm not saying a hospital should turn people away, but um, an emergency room should say, "Oh, you have the flu. Oh, uh, you, you um, need such and such a check." No, this is the emergency room for emergencies. You need to go down the hall to the care clinic or whatever it is. But that's actually something that is happening some. Well, and what many people don't know is, you know, there are networks that exist throughout every state. Um, They're federally qualified health centers. There are 320 across Texas. Um, There are some in just multiple sites in each county. Um, There are health clinics 
that are available. And what we've seen with this jump start through the ACA is the acceleration for hospitals uh, to provide neighborhood networks. And one of the things they've done is to look at where are the zip codes where we're getting the most influx from the, to the ER that people are coming in for bringing their children with asthma, whereas if they had um, an easily accessible service near their neighborhood, they could do the preventive piece that doesn't require waiting until it's an emergency or a crisis. And so what you see is the shift that's going on all across the country for those kinds of resources, people maybe that couldn't, access before a private physician but now have a multi and the other thing about the ACA is that it pushes the idea of quality care maybe somebody really needs a social worker mm-hmm. as opposed to a physician or if you've got a broken arm are they asking the questions how did that happen maybe it's driven by a domestic violence situation so there's a push for looking at those social determinants that are much broader than an initial crisis. And do you know, in my... In wellness. Yeah. So I'll point back to wellness. Exactly. What's going on here, you know? In exactly. my wellness exam, they gave me like a four-page questionnaire uh, that went at just those kinds of questions. Uh, like, but I, I read them to my doctor and I said, they want to know if I'm too shy to talk to people, they want. To, <laughs> I, I don't think that's my problem. Am I afraid? You know, and it was like like one thing after another that, y- yeah, I'm having that problem. And he just laughed and said, "Don't bother filling that out, please, <laughs> because our people will not know what to do with your answers." So, yeah. David, what you know to to circle back to what you were talking about, um, you know, patients going to to uh, an emergency room instead of going to see a physician. Um, I want to uh, mention that there's a phenomenal campaign with CMS called Coverage to Care, uh, that the navigators out in the community are educating consumers. Um, and we educate them from, you know, complex terminology to know how to read your insurance card to know when is a good moment to go to the emergency room and when is a good moment to grab the phone and call your your consumer uh, your your physician to schedule an appointment so so i think the education uh, uh um piece is very very important and is one of the hats that we wear um because we believe that educating uh, the community is going to is going to make that switch to no you know we we're seeing uh, uh less people going to the emergency room for a flu uh an increase in consumers calling a doctor to sketch an appointment to go get antibiotics for that flu. So, so again, I, I am pro-education, and, and, and I, I believe that my navigators out in the field are educating those consumers on, on things like that. And Daniel, that is a great point, and it's a great opportunity to remind the listeners that um, sometimes the best education is peer education. If it's a voice that they recognize or somebody that speaks a language that is a comfort zone for the listener. And what we've got right now, your story really can make a huge difference. Um, so you can join the conversation on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram by sharing why health care health coverage was important to you so when you mentioned coverage to care it's hashtag coverage matters and um, every one of our listeners can play a big part in getting one more person to join the prevention and wellness journey so that we're all healthier and I think you know too that that encourages people to say, "Well, that story almost is exactly mine." Exactly. And and look what happened here. This could happen. You know, this could be an improvement in my life as well. Just a reminder: the LGBT voice is so important. And um, so share your story. Yeah, it's not going to be after January twentieth. <laughs> <laughs> hashtag no. coverage matters. Um, one of the reasons to do this is there's going to be a fight over repealing the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and it's a matter of are they going to repeal? Are they going to repeal and replace? Are, are they going to, and, and if they're repealing and replacing and replacing with something that works better, look, the original act was over a thousand pages. Nobody expected it to be perfect from the beginning. 
I mean, Medicare, Social Security, every program has had adjustments over the years. You have to. You have to, to to get it right. But there's never been an attempt to get this right in Congress. The, the attempt has been just to get rid of it. So there is going to be a, uh, a rush to repeal. Repeal and replace with something better that will get more people insured. That's great. Repeal and replace a couple of years later. That's going to be extremely expensive because... Okay, we'll have the Affordable Care Act next year, then the year after we won't, and then they'll replace the year after, but that'll be phased in over a number of years. That's going to be bad. That's going to be... If that that happens... Isn't that going to be expensive to do? I I mean, I would think, and I I don't know that you can comment on that. That's one of those things, uh, Marge, that, um, you know, who knows what they're going to do. But I think you can make a difference by writing to your legislator, especially if you live in a Republican district. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I saw Eddie Bernice Johnson on Friday, and she's on board with the Affordable Care Act. Oh, yeah. You don't have to worry about <laughs> <She> encouraging <laughs> her. Um, what you can do for her, because I asked her what people can do, she said, oh, honey, pray for me. <laughs> 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 but... Uh, if you live in, like, Pete Sessions District or whatever, they understand that people are on health care for the first time and that they're going to lose their policies. Tell them. And I think too often people are afraid to contact their Congress people. Tell them that, that you want them to keep it or only repeal when they're going to replace with something that will cover more people. Right. I, I agree with that. Absolutely. Re- repeal and replace cannot mean... Uh, it could end up, if particularly if it's repeal and delay, it could mean repeal and collapse. And what it would lead to is the instability of the mar- the insurance market. A lot of the assurances of hospitals and providers in providing the care and supporting the continuing uh, delivery service um, changes that are going on right now that are very positive. So. And, and what you just described, Marge, just the is something that affects the stock market. Even the stock market loves stability, and if an entire sector in our in our economy, namely healthcare, which is enormous, were to suddenly be destabilized, that could affect. I mean, it has a huge ripple effect in our entire economy. Right. I don't. As I said earlier, I don't think Americans want to go back to replacing the donut hole. Um, to kicking the young adults off. A lot of the and pre-existing conditions and the pre-existing and condition issue and all the numbers that that would affect. So what are the parts that you're hearing that people just hate in the Affordable Care Act? <laughs> I'm sorry that they hate in Obamacare. <laughs> because, what, I mean, what we keep hearing from Congress people is, so you're going to do away with uh, pre-existing conditions. Oh, no, 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 people like that. So you're going to do away with... Uh, Keeping people on their insurance, on their parents' insurance till they're 20. Oh, no, no, no. People like that. Yeah, so what's left? What are they really going to do to change it? What are. I don't know. Well, it could be that repeal and replace is we take Obamacare, we rename it, we repeal that one, we put the old one back back in under the new name, and everybody loves it all of a sudden. Or is it. Or are people just upset, the ones who don't like it, claim not to like it? Are they just upset because they're being forced to get insurance? I mean, have you heard any feedback? And Daniel, do you hear that from some people? I, I, and I would guess not because people who are going to you for help are people who want insurance. You're not contacting the people who well, don't we see, want insurance. We see um, a little bit of both sides. Um, you know, the people that they they have to, but just like Patty was saying, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just such a blessing to have health insurance and to have access to care so we always try to you know turn turn that mentality um i always try to share the analogy of car insurance having car, car insurance is the law and we love it when we need it correct um and even just basic liability, that's the law. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's the law. It's a law. It's, it, it, I mean, you, you, you have, have to. have said, oh, let's take that to the Supreme Court because that's just so unfair. Yeah. So, so <laughs> I, you know, the analogy is you, you have an accident. You love that insurance. And you call your insurance right away. And nobody complains about it. So, so when you have an accident health-wise, you know, I mean, 
your health insurance is right there to use. So um, it's important to, to think that way. And we try to change the mentality of those consumers. And, uh, you know, uh, they always leave our office happy. They're able to look at their options in the marketplace. If they didn't find anything, there's other options. We always try to offer resources. Um, so, so I want to say that people that leave our offices or our navigators, they're always in, on a positive note. Give us the number to uh, contact you again. It's 844-831-9600. Um, and, and we are ready, ready to help. Um, and Daniel is a wonderful resource in this listening area. Um, and if, if, if the audience is interested in just getting feedback that's anonymous and do shopping for their insurance resources, you can call healthcare.gov and the 1-800 number, which is 318-1-800-318-2596, and walk through the website to educate yourself. And then call Daniel and say, okay, now how does this apply in Waco or Dallas or Fort Worth? Um, and then right. another another good thing is to have together the things that you might need to find out whether you qualify for some assistance with the for the um, the credit the tax credit absolutely so what would that be like your W two if you're employed W uh, two previous yeah. tax tax returns maybe uh, yeah. gather all that together all that and then you can you have everything you need then to yeah. to find out whether you qualify yeah I, because you know, you might qualify and that would be even. Yeah, more assistance to, to get you on to a plan. Yeah, you know? and consumers need to know that there's no commitment by visiting healthcare.gov. There's no commitment by seeing one of us at the community council. Um, we just want to help. We just want to help you access for you to look at your options. And if you don't find anything, that, that's absolutely fine. There's no commitment by looking and by applying. And for those that qualify for a premium tax credit to lower those premiums, there's no better way to just just look. Right, and we do know, as I mentioned earlier, the 38,000 people are leaving money on the table mm -hmm. because they could be eligible for a subsidy or a tax credit. So it's in their best interest to, to you know, right. get over there, call the number, find out. Uh, what's the number again? So directly through the Community Council of Greater Dallas is 844-831-9600. And healthcare.gov, it's one 800 Three one six two oh three one eight sorry two five nine six. You know, it's just about top of the hour. Next show is not here yet, so we can keep talking for a few minutes till they get here. Um, let's do our top of the hour just so that we're legal. You're listening to KNON eighty nine point three FM in Dallas and Fort Worth, the voice of the people. Okay, um, you're listening to Lambda Weekly on 89.3 KNO and FM. I'm Dave Taffet here in the studio with Laurent Landis and Patty Fink. Um, can you stay with us just a few more minutes? And we'll just talk. I'm sure they're on their way. And sure. um, uh, so One of the things that we've been talking about is how health care has really changed uh, since the Affordable Care Act has come in. Um, are there other things that you've seen you know, and we started talking about this a little bit with the community clinics as opposed to go accessing your health care with, um, uh, through an emergency room. Mm -hmm. Okay, they'll be here in five minutes. So. Okay. Um, so what are some of the other things that you've seen or even that you've seen that you'd like to see changed? A perfect example. Thank you, David, for asking that question. Um, one of the things that we've seen in hospitals in Texas is really a focus on population health. So that, for example, uh, clients that the emergency rooms are required to serve everyone that comes. But if you're triaged and identified that you've got a, you've got diabetes. So to put together a group of folks that have diabetes and walk them through, um, of food, developing, you know, a menu that is responsive to diabetes so that it helps them manage their health condition better. Those are projects that have occurred all throughout Texas. There's 1,400 of them wow. that have been sponsored by hospitals that are focused specifically on population health. What is it in our community that there is the greatest need for? Um, it also includes the behavioral health piece, substance abuse, uh, mental health support. So the hospitals are getting very adept at identifying 
groups of folks that could learn from each other and support each other, but also be educated in the process. Have you heard from hospitals, um, either of you, that the burden has lessened in the emergency room since the Affordable Care Act? Well, I think it's all an educational process, but because of these special projects that they have worked on, I think it's a better management of the influx of people coming into the the ER. Hmm. And there's something, too, I think the LGBT community should pay particular attention to uh, that's, that's coming, um, and that's through, um, through what we used to call meaningful use. Um, and I believe it now it's MACRA. There's some some name for it but it's a requirement that um that your that your providers can ask you um and it's completely optional for your reply um ask you what your sexual orientation is they can ask you what your how you self-identify as um in terms of gender um and that's purely optional and they, they can capture the information and that's the beginning of toward a population health look um your opportunity to contribute to data about our community because really absolutely it, unless you go to some place like Fenway Health in Boston or um, some some place that's really LGBT focused you're probably not going to get known about in the population health specter um, as an LGBT person mm-hmm. and so if you're if you're asked by a provider and it's on a form you fill out before your appointment um, and you're comfortable with it, please do share that. I think it's it's great that we get the beginnings of some real um, kind of look at what, what kind of things are, in terms of population health, are affecting the LGBT population. And that's across the country. So Absolutely. hopefully in a couple of years after people answer the questions, and you can decline, it's fine. But if, you're, if you feel comfortable doing so, please do, because that will help us build a look at, and, and the more we look at it, we found with lots of things in our community, the more we look at it and have some data to work with, well, the more we can, can take action on that. I mean, I agree if you're comfortable, but if you're not comfortable, I say get comfortable. Yep. <laughs> I mean, it's in your best interest. Right. You know, right. Um, especially. And it's, it's protected by HIPAA just like it everything is. else. So, it is. Um, you know, you can just, you can, if you feel yeah. comfortable, please do. This is a, the beginnings. Uh, you know, imagine their time when they wouldn't even ask us. Mm-hmm. Well, now it's there. It's coming. Yeah. So. There's much, uh, you know, uh, an increased recognition and emphasis on uh, equality and lack of discrimination well, right. across the board. I mean, if you're just delivering health care, and that's a piece of health care, um, just understanding, like, how many times have I heard from lesbian friends that they couldn't get their doctor to understand they do not need birth control? <laughs> Stop wasting my time on that, right? <laughs> true. So, true. you know, just those little things, just deliver the best health care that I need for me. And I'm not asking for your judgment about who I am. I'm just asking you to treat me. But we know that in our community, um, with or without the Affordable Care Act, there's a lot of... of reluctance to be candid with your physician and other providers unless you feel comfortable because they could, I mean, in a, in a world where we're not equal and not protected by law, um, there is that fear that you're going to be treated lesser than. Except with 1557, you now are protected. Exactly. Exactly. So that's hopefully over time that will settle in and people who would think, well, I don't have to do, a, you know, full you know, talk quality care for those people, you know, it'll it'll change. And so we we have that. But we know that people are reluctant to talk oftentimes with their doctors and, and come out to their providers. In little small towns, it's a big deal. I've always asked my doctor their central or not because I want to know. <laughs> so if I can ask them, I think they should be able to ask me. Mm-hmm. So, but, I mean, again, this goes under the category of are you ever too shy to <laughs> which I didn't qualify for but so. I think it was Harvey Milk that said rights are won only by those who make their voices heard mm-hmm. so exactly. it's up exactly. to us mm-hmm. to everybody yeah, to absolutely. share what we know and what we need to know mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly that's exactly it um, <laughs> s- since we're doing a second hour of this um, <laughs> let's just go back uh, Daniel is a, he works with healthcare navigators. So if you didn't hear this earlier, um, just real quickly, um, 
what does a healthcare navigator do? What can you do for somebody? Uh, who qualifies to work with you? Um, so navigators, we, we wear many different hats, but one of them is, of course, uh, we help the consumer access affordable health care and quality health care through the marketplace. So we're going to um, help the consumer uh, with the application process. We're going to help them um, find the right providers. We're going to help them uh, find uh, a plan that is going to cover their medication. But the most important part now that we do is education. So we help consumers understand health insurance in general, from complex terminology to how to use it, how to read your insurance card, how to contact a doctor, how to make an appointment, um, when to go to the emergency room, when to go to see a physician, um, and also the advocacy part. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll, we'll wear many different hats in the community, but, but um, uh, that's what we uh, are doing. And uh, don't, don't forget the December 15 deadline that navigators were working so, so hard to make sure that consumers are um, enrolling by December 15 for their insurance to begin on January 1st. Right, because the next deadline is January 31st? January 31st. And then your insurance doesn't kick in for another month after that, March 1st, so March you would 1st. be without for two months. That is correct. Um, and one other thing, if somebody decides not to enroll in the ACA, and I'm assuming no repeal when I'm asking this question, but the way the law stands now, what would the penalty be for not enrolling? So the penalty uh, continues to be the same as 2016, which is uh, $695 uh, per person, or 2.5% uh, of their of their income, household income. So that could wow. be that could pretty be high for somebody yeah. who's, who can afford insurance. Health insurance, absolutely. Right. So, um, and, um, oh, okay, the next show is here. There, Let them get set up for a few minutes, so we're going to wrap it up. Um, if somebody – have you ever had this? Has somebody come to you, you know, you're saying you want to get them on the right medication, but they haven't had health insurance before. Uh, now they are they they're, they're qualify for insurance. They can go to a doctor, and they find that the plan is just not really what they need because they have other medications and they need other specialists that aren't on – but people cannot change their plan in the middle of the year, right? They they have to wait until the next year to change. That is correct. Or like um, Amarj was saying, uh, there's there's exemptions and there's appeals mm -hmm. that that we could we could help with, and uh, we certainly help you know accessing those appeals through their insurance company. But you are correct, mm -hmm. uh, unless you qualify for a special enrollment period, uh, a birth of a child, uh, loss of coverage, uh, income changes, a perfectly legal marriage, mm -hmm. legal in marriage, the state of Texas. absolutely. <laughs> um, so that qualifies you for a special enrollment period that could, you could access. Healthcare, your long. Okay. Marsh, you look like you had one thing to say just no, to wrap I up. Just, oh, I okay. just want to thank you all for the opportunity to be with you today and also thank Daniel for his work. There are also people within the community that aren't just through Daniel's group. They're called, uh, they are certified to assist and they may be among a lot of the not for profits that people work through uh, DFW area in a lot of the community coalitions that mm -hmm. we have. Good. I want to thank you both for being here. Daniel thank Bhutan, you. who is with the uh, Community Council of Greater Dallas. Marge Petty is with the Department of Health and Human Services. Thank you both for being thank here. Thank you, thank you very sir. much. Thank you. This is William, hopefully your favorite videographer from Two Hats Publishing. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like it, please leave comments below or like follow or subscribe to us and get notices of all our videos. We love it even when you call. <laughs>